And we are back. And so thank you again, everybody, for coming with us on our journey on week seven of the Select Chicago Foreign Direct Investment Conference. This is our fifth annual conference, and every year it gets bigger and, and better. During this uh, session, we're going to be talking with Rocio Rivera with the uh, Mexican Consulate General in Chicago's office. I've gotten to know Rocio through her attendance on our Select Chicago community tours. So when uh, before COVID set in, but once a month, we would have a number of the trade offices learning about the local Chicago region. The last trip that we were on was in Michigan City, Indiana, where we got to learn about uh, the investment opportunities of Michigan City, but also um, a number of the companies that are already in Michigan City, Indiana that are foreign owned. One of the reasons why I thought that this was a good uh, program to have is something that we learned about this summer, which was how much the border plex, which is down in the uh, Rio Grande, uh, El Paso area, and how much interaction there is between the Mexican border and the United States border with a number of manufacturing and commerce, and learning that Veracruz, Mexico's third largest export area in the world is actually the greater Chicago region. So while we might not be focusing on that exactly for this discussion today, it was really important to talk about Mexico as a critical partner for the United States now that USMCA is uh, active and engaged. And we had an earlier talk about how Canada and Mexico work with uh, USMCA in the United States, but I really thought it was important to have Rocio uh, spend a lot more time in focusing on uh, Mexico. So, Rocio, with that, I'm going to uh, have you take that away. Why don't you introduce your, yourself and your background, and we'll get to that. And I'll come back in for Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for the invitation, and thank you to the Select uh, Chicago team for putting uh, this very innovative uh, way to have conversations regarding the promotion of trade and investment around the world. Um, so today, as you already say, I want to have a discussion on the economic ties between Mexico and the US, with a particular focus on the Midwest and with Illinois and Indiana. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about my department. Um, as you uh, may know previously, uh, ProMexico, uh, which was our agency uh, in charge of the uh, promotion and investment activities, had to close um, um, due to austerity purposes. So now each uh, consulate here in the US has a Department of Economic Affairs. Um, in which we carry out uh, these activities of promotion uh, of commerce, investment, and also tourism. Uh, so that is why um, in the case of the Consulate General of Mexico in Chicago, we cover the state of Illinois and the northern part of Indiana. So probably um, you have heard uh, from my colleagues and friends uh, of other uh, trade offices that their countries cover between 12 and 14 states. But in the case of Mexico, because we have 50 uh, consulates across the US, that is why in this case, we cover the state of Illinois and the northern part of Indiana. Uh, so I would like to divide my presentation uh, in three sections. First, I would like to give an overview of uh, the results of NAFTA uh, for the region in the past 26 years and why for the three countries, for Canada, Mexico, and the US, was really so important to maintain our free trade agreement. And as you know, this resulted in the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, the USMCA. I'm not going to go uh, deeper into the USM USMCA provisions because as you said, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a panel here uh, um, that talked about USMCA with our colleagues from Canada and uh, with the participation of the Chicago International Trade uh, Commissioner Association. Um, in the second uh, 
next part, I would like to talk about Mexico and the economic relationship with particularly Illinois and Indiana. And finally, in the third section, I would like to talk about why choose Mexico uh, when doing business. So I'm going to start uh, with the presentation. So um, NAFTA created one of the most competitive and dynamic regions, regions in the world. Um, as you can see, um, we have a population close to 500 million people. We represent 6.5% of uh, the world population. Our, our GDP together represent $26 trillion, and that makes us the second largest economy in the world. And also together, we represent 18.3% of the world's GDP. Now, in terms of uh, foreign direct investment, uh, in 2018, we were the first recipient in the world, representing 23% of the foreign direct investment globally. In terms of trade, as a block, we are the second global exporter, which represents almost 16% of the total global trade. And with the intra, our intra-trade accounts for $1.2 trillion. So here you can see um, the dynamism of our trade since uh, NAFTA entered into force in 1994. Uh, since then, it has uh, growth at an annual rate of 7.5%. So not only Mexico was able to increase its export platform, but also um, we became an important client for the US and Canada. So we increased our uh, imports too. Here in this graph, you can see that um, the trade has increased throughout the years with um, a decrease in 2009, of course, due to the um, economic crisis. And now here we um, are expecting how this is going to look like in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, now, thanks to NAFTA, the foreign direct investment substantially increased. And as you can see, from 1992 uh, March 2020, Mexico has received $589 billion. Um, the US and Canada account for more than half of the total foreign direct investment received by Mexico. Uh, $277 billion from the US. So um, it is our most important investment investor. And Canada is also a very important par partner for Mexico. It is our third source of foreign direct investment with $41 uh, billion. So in, in, in um, 12, 19, sorry, 2019, Mexico was the US top trading partner. Uh, we traded $614.5 billion in goods. Um, so when NAFTA became effective, Mexico's participation or share in the U.S. market was around 7%. Uh, so here you can see that today Mexico is close to 15%. Um, so as a result of this deepened integration, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. have become key partners. As you may know, um, almost 80% of our exports go to the US. Canada is also uh, a success story for us. Uh, before NAFTA in 1993, our trade was around $2 billion. Now, um, last year, we traded with Canada $25 billion. So you can see how um, these um, trade has increased significantly. 
Uh, Mexico is also the uh, US top trading partner in agricultural products. After 26 years, um, USMCA will continue to bring um, significant results uh, for the agricultural sector. Um, in 2019, Mexico and the US traded more than $47 billion in agricultural products. Today, Mexico buys $19 billion and sells $28 billion. So this reflects the complementarities of our two economies. And this shows that we have been able to offer better products to our population with, with high quality, um, with an accessible cost. So another uh, very interesting part of this uh, successful um, partnership is that we not only have been able to trade uh, among the three countries, but we also produce together to compete globally. We have um, specialized uh, and we trade similar products. So uh, for example, the automotive sector, um, here you can see that Mexico exports $35 billion uh, to the US. We also export computer, and you can see that we buy uh, components for computers. So we are specializing within the same sectors like electronics, industrial machinery, and the auto parts. So the automotive industry is a very good example of how uh, well integrated is this sector. And here I just want to um, talk a little bit about the changes that we are going to see from NAFTA to USMCA in this sector. Um, with NAFTA, in order for a car to leave Mexico to the US without paying tariffs, 62.5% had um, must had a regional contact. So therefore manufacturers can import all, uh, the remaining 37.5%. Now, with USMCA, this rule is restricted since it rises from 62.5% to 75%. So this means that if manufacturers installed in Mexico want to continue enjoying zero tariffs to supply the US market, they will have to import fewer parts and invest more in the countries of the region. So this change, uh, it's an incentive uh, for investment in the three countries um, so that we can um, uh, buy from more from each other. So also you can see here that 38% of Mexican auto parts originate in the US. So before a car is finally assembled, auto parts cross our border up to eight times. Uh, now, if we break down this economic partnership, um, I would like you to see how is the relationship between Mexico and the different states in the US. Um, so here you can see that 29 states have Mexico as their first, second or third largest export market. Of course, here you can see uh, the the yellow um, um, states that have Mexico as, a, as their largest export market are the bordering states, uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, the green states have Mexico as a, the second uh, largest export market. Here you can see the case of the Midwest and in particularly Illinois and Indiana. So this reflects the fact that we already have a very significant trade relationship um, that, it, that we need to um, take care of. Now also here you can see that nearly 5 million US jobs depend on uh, trade with Mexico. Of course, our usual suspects 
uh, are always California and Texas because the uh, trade relationship is so strong. But here, as you can see, in third place, we have New York and then Florida, and in, in the fifth place, Illinois, uh, in which almost 200 uh, jobs here in the state depend on the trade with Mexico. So now in this second part, I will specifically talk about uh, our relationship with Illinois and the state of Indiana. So in the case of the trade between Mexico and the state of Indiana, um, you can see here that the average annual growth of our trade in the last 10, year, 10 years um, is 9.8%. Uh, so it's higher than the national average. Um, Indiana's imports in 2019 uh, was 5.2 billion dollars in uh, their exports were 5.7 billion dollars and you can see that in the last year we had an increase of uh, nine percent now let's uh, look at the mexico illinois uh, bilateral trade relationship here we see that um, the average annual growth has been of 8.67%, uh, also higher than the national average. Um, the um, state's imports from Mexico have been $12.8 billion and the exports 9.3. Um, now here, as you can see regarding uh, the top five Indiana's trading partners into, uh, in 2019, Mexico uh, here ranks in the second place. So we are the second trading partner of Indiana with a share of 10.5%. Uh, and also if we take all the 50 states, we see that um, Indiana is the 11th um, trading partner of Mexico. Now, in the case of uh, Illinois, here you can see that um, Mexico is the third trading partner of the state with a total trade of $22.1 billion. But here you can see that actually Mexico is the second export market of Illinois. So this means that we are a very good client to the state and that we really uh, buy a lot of products uh, from the region. Now, if we take the top uh, five Mexico's state uh, trading partners, we see, um, as usual, Texas and California are at the top. In third place, we have Michigan. And then in fourth, uh, we have Illinois. This is really, really interesting because um, let me give you some numbers to see if these $22.1 billion that we trade um, is a significant number or not. Uh, Mexico trades more with Illinois than with Japan. So Illinois by itself could be a country. Um, as I was telling you before about our uh, trade relationship with Canada, now mexico and canada trade um 25 billion dollars so our trade with illinois is also very close to the one that we trade to uh, with um, canada so as you can see our re our relationship with illinois is really really important here we have uh, the almost 200 uh, 000 jobs that here in the state are supported by trade uh, with Mexico, we have a $9.3 billion exports to Mexico, uh, which represent a 15.5% of its total exports, and the $12.8 billion uh, imports from Mexico, which represents 7.8% uh, of its total imports. Um, so Mexico and Illinois, as I was telling you, um, the trade accounts for 
1.1 billion and um, supports regional supply chains um, that are specialized in electronics, industrial machinery, agricultural, and auto on the automotive sectors. So this picture is really, really similar uh, to the one that I was uh, explaining to you before about the uh, dynamic uh, between Mexico and the US as a whole. So um, in a sense, we replicate that dynamic uh, between Mexico and Illinois. For example, here you can see uh, that the product that we uh, most export to Illinois is beer. Uh, and in the case of Illinois to Mexico, uh, the second product is corn. Uh, as you may know, uh, in Mexico, corn is a very important element in our diet. And also here uh, you can see um, uh, televisions, ele electric panels, auto parts again, and the same uh, in the case of the uh, Illinois exports to Mexico, the auto parts, electric switches, medical instruments, etc. So this dynamic uh, pretty much resembles the same interaction as we have um, in, in the whole economies between Mexico and the US. So now, why choose Mexico? Mexico is the um, seventh largest exporter in the world and the first in um, Latin America. Uh, we have 13 free trade agreements, including the new USMCA. Uh, we have uh, a, a, relation with, a, a trade relationship with 48 countries uh, that connect to our economy, which represents an access to more than 1.3 billion consumers, which represents 60% of the world's GDP. Um, among our free trade agreements, we have the CPTPP, which is a comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which links uh, Mexico to the Asian region. Um, some of the members of this um, partnership um, are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, um, Singapore, and Vietnam. We uh, just finished the modernization of our tree, free trade agreement with the European Union. As you can see here, we have an agreement, a free trade agreement with Israel, with Central America, and we are also uh, members of the Pacific Alliance in Latin America. Um, also, Mexico strongly supports the multilateral uh, trading system, and as you can see, we are very, very committed to uh, free trade. So also, Mexico offers um, a very solid infrastructure and logistics uh, network. According to the World Economic Forum, Mexico ranks among the top 38% countries with the best transport infrastructure. Um, as you know, having a, a, a strong infrastructure is essential to guarantee a fluid integration of the supply chains of production. Most of our commerce with the US uh, goes by land. Here, as you can see, uh, 172,000 kilometers in roads, where 62.5% of Mexico's total export, exports move. Uh, 27,000 kilometers in railway tracks, which moves 13% uh, of Mexico's total exports. We have 117 ports, which moves 19.7% of our total exports. And also we have 70, uh, six airports, uh, of which 64 are international. We have 12 that are domestic, which move for 4.3 percent of Mexico's total exports. We also have an, um, a strategic location and very competitive uh, logistics uh, cost. Uh, for example, from Mexico moving. Um, things from Mexico to the US 
the shipping cost is nine US dollar per cubic meter in contrast with China that is uh, 140 dollars. Um, Mexico also offers the IMEX program that you may know as a maquiladora program which contemplates um, tax benefits for companies that are importing products or raw materials to support their export platform. In terms of, in terms of maritime uh, days, as you can see here, um, for example, from Mexico to New York, it takes four days, five days, sorry. From Mexico to LA, four days. Mexico to the Netherlands, 16 days. And from Mexico to Japan, 19 um, days. Mexico also has a diverse and innovative industrial platform. We rank as the 19th most complex economy in which 60% of our exports are related to high complexity um, sectors. So you can see here that the um, auto industry represents 23% of this uh, uh, share. We have also machinery with a 20% and electro electronics also with 20% of exports. 66.2% um, of the world's total automotive exports are done by Mexico and 3.8% of the world's total electronics exports are exported by Mexico. Mexico also leads in manufacturing production. Uh, we became the sixth largest world producer of vehicles in 2019 and ranked fourth as exporter worldwide. Um, we also are the sixth largest supplier of aircraft parts to the US, um, the sixth largest exporter of information technology products and services the eighth largest exporter of medical devices worldwide. And also we are the 13th recipient of foreign direct investment worldwide and the second in Latin America. We also have a competitive and cost effective, uh, a cost effective manufacturing sector. As you can see here, the global manufacturing cost Competitive index, uh, which measures manufacturing costs of uh, the world's top exporter economies. Um, as you may know, the index takes into consideration four aspects, um, the manufacturing wages, productivity, energy costs, and currency exchange rates compared uh, with the US dollar. Here, this index takes um, the US as the benchmark with a score of, of 100. So here you can see uh, Mexico with um, 86, which means that manufacturing costs are lower than those of the US. Also in terms of um, internet connectivity, um, Mexico is third in mobile broadband subscriptions within OECD members. Uh, we have a 74% mobile penetration rate 17% annual growth in the past five years and 92 million broadband um, subscriptions. So um, this is very relevant in particularly for the digital economy chapter that now is contemplated in the new USMCA. 26 years ago with uh, when NAFTA uh, entered into force we didn't have internet and we didn't have all these um, electronic devices. So we didn't have one chapter related to e-commerce. Um, so now this is very, very relevant. Uh, and also because we have seen that with the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a sector that has a lot of potential um, and also is going to benefit um, small and medium enterprises that are also contemplated in the agreement. We didn't have a chapter before in NAFTA that covered SMEs, and now we do have one um, in USMCA. And finally, we also have a very young, uh, competitive, and skilled workforce. Um, 
Mexico, as you can see here, has a very young population. The average um, age is 27 years. Um, we have a market close to 130 million potential consumers, and we have a highly trained workforce. Here, as you can see, more engineers graduate each year from Mexico compared to other countries. So this is um, very important for the three countries um, to have a, a, a very well-trained um, workforce. Um, we have uh, understood that we need to invest more in human capital, when, which is one of our most valuable resources. And increasingly, we have seen more um, collaborations between Mexico and the US to invest in human capital. And I just want to give you uh, an example that I think illustrates uh, very well this, um, this issue. Um, a couple of years ago, the Arkansas uh, State University opened a campus in the state of Querétaro in Mexico. So Querétaro is a state that locates um, at the center of Mexico. And um, the university there offers degrees uh, on aeronaut aeronaut aeronautics, sorry, biomechanics, nanotechnology, manufacturing, and robotics. And the reason is that Querétaro has become one of the most important aerospace uh, industry clusters in Mexico. So here you can see an example of how we are um, linking um, education and the um, industrial developments in Mexico. Well, this is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And here um, I'm going to leave my um, my, info, my contact information. I invite you to um, visit our website, um, consulmex.sre.gov.mx slash Chicago, where you can go to the economic affairs section to know more about um, our trade uh, figures and data. Great, great. And so, Rocio, thank you so much for bringing all this uh, information here. And one of the things that you may or may not know, because how, um, let me back up a little bit. So uh, how long have you been deployed with the Consulate General's office in Chicago? One year. One year. And, um, and, I, and before uh, the Consulate General's office was doing a lot of trade and investment, we were working with ProMexico uh, for a number of years. And one of the things about where we are in the Waukegan area, where we're filming today, which is the corporate parent for Select Chicago, is uh, used to be known as Greater Waukegan Development Coalition. Now it's just GWDC. Uh, one of the interesting features of the city of Waukegan is roughly 67% of the population comes from Latin America. And so we used to put together an El Grito celebration every year. So I get to take out my, uh, sometimes you have pictures on your phone, but sometimes you have posters on the wall. So the Mexican relationship, let's see if I can get, I got to get this in the camera frame. Oh, it's upside down. That doesn't help. So we would put on a small celebration, and I'll probably get a better picture of this for, the, for uh Later, we'd bring roughly 20,000 people to downtown Waukegan to celebrate El Grito for a three-day uh, festival celebrating Latin American music, spe specifically um, you know, Mexican music. And this is great. We would fly in bands from Mexico City to play, and we would just have uh, tremendous amounts of, um, of good time. I actually got to have my first elote uh, with that. So you're talking about corn being very important to Mexican cuisine. And so the whole mayonnaise in uh, corn uh, was something that, you know, I'm not allowed to eat. That would be bad for my cholesterol, but uh, it was very delicious. 
And so this is so this is when I started today. I was talking about how important Mexico is to the you know select Chicago region, but also how important Mexico is to the you know North Lake County region, just because it's such a center urban population of uh, people from Latin America, specifically Mexico. And we've had the consulate general in Mexico at the time, about four years ago, doing uh, proclamations, which was great. But what uh, is great to see of how much trade there is and opportunity there is with Mexico. Uh, one of the things you had talked about, which was the age of the Mexican workforce. And the interesting thing, and you had mentioned that the average age of the Mexican workforce is 27. But for comparison, the average age in the United States is roughly 38. So there is a big gap between the young, uh, growing populations of Mexico and the <clears throat> more advanced age of the people in the United States. And so this looks out for a demographic projection of having a long, stable relationship because we both have growing populations versus other countries that have declining populations. So I just wanted to put some of that in context. Uh, but uh, it's also interesting to see is most Americans also look at Me Mexico for tourism. And so tourism, how much, Rocio, does tourism comprise of the economy of the country of Mexico? Okay, but what's nice about that is that is only 8% of the GDP, which um, I've been going to up and back from Mexico since I was in college um, thir uh, 35 years ago now. And it's just great to see how much the Mexican economy is diversified, where you were talking about the total amount of broadband subscribers and the, the amount of people in engineering and growing and keeping the talent local. What is also interesting to see is just how with uh, the frosting of relations with countries in South, Southeast Asia, Mexico, because it's part of the USMCA, is poised to help create symbiotic relationships to increase factors of production for things to bring back to this region that were more efficient to possibly build in Southeast Asia. But do you see some opportunities in Mexico to bring some of these uh, manufacturing concepts back to Mexico and uh, the Southwest United yes. States? Yes, Michael, actually um, what we have seen at the consulate um, with the pandemic is that more companies have approached us because they are looking into um, suppliers from Mexico, um, particularly from the automotive sector and electronics. Uh, so now we have seen a move that I believe it started before the pandemic with the trade um, issues between uh, the US and China. So many companies started to look in again into Mexico. But with the pandemic, uh, we realized that we need to have a stronger regional uh, supply chains. So yes, we have seen in the past months that there is an increasing interest uh, from companies in the US to find uh, suppliers and new partners in Mexico. And that's great. Um, I think when our opening session back in early September, we talked about the changes of the supply chain to being just in, from a just in time to a just in time and just in case. And what's wonderful about Mexico being a strong partner with the United States in our manufacturing in uh, the Midwest is everything that we can get that can be produced in Mexico can come via road and be here within five days and not get put on a shipping container from 
uh, you t had maritime uh, rates or times and being able to know that somebody could just literally get into a car, drive down to go receive product if need be, uh, it could ha those things are possible. So you give a lot of peace of mind knowing um, Mexico is our strong friend. We, yeah, exactly. We have at the border more than 50 points of entry between Mexico and the US. So the, this gives you a, a very good idea of how intense our trade is. Um, and also when you mentioned about um, this, um, I mean, region, uh, regional supply chains, uh, what we um, noticed with the pandemic is that we didn't have like the same definitions about what is an essential industry, what is an, an essential um, sector. So we had a problem there because Canada and the US has, have the same definition, but with Mexico, it was different. And we had a disruption in our supply chain. So now uh, governments started talking and we correct uh, that. So we now can have um, the same definition and the same industries um, that belong to the um, essential um, sector definition. Mm -hmm. And let's see, some of the other things, uh, it was great to learn that Mexico has a stronger trading relationship with Illinois than all of Japan. I think that was when we were looking at that as a country. So those were some good uh, information uh, for that. And then um, it's also very good seeing the population growth with you know, with Mexico, and I mentioned it before, is just it's such a good opportunity for companies that are looking to penetrate into the Mexico market is there's a lot of good U.S. resources. Right before we got on with you, Rocio, we had Allison Germack with DFC, which is the uh, one of the U United States... Uh, programs that helps for businesses to expand you know, and set up operations in other countries like Mexico. So they had done a number of uh, investment and straight equity investments into Mexico uh, in the last, I think, 14, 18 months. And that winds up, and so building on, so what we've been talking about today, which was more of U.S. companies looking to expand from here to there, we had Estonia on earlier. We have you today, you, you at this hour. Uh, we have India in the Middle East later in the day. But also knowing that Mexico is a con country that is eligible to do, we use DFC as a financing vehicle and getting technical support to help create bi move businesses to set up operations in Mexico. And, and, and obviously, Rocio, I'm happy to introduce you to Allison and learn more about that too, because I know you had other, th it, uh, there's just a really great program that you should be aware of. Um, I wanna see if we have some things from uh, questions abroad and then we'll get you going for the day. I think uh, one of the questions that I gotten earlier I have my notes, and it's always having fun with my notes, is <clears throat> looking, at, looking at when trade restrictions end. It was just interesting, not trade restrictions, but, um, well, right now I think the border is open between Mexico and the United States during this time of COVID. Uh, we do have one restriction in place uh, between our countries that started uh, on March 20th. And... Um, so basically, this restriction um, says that um, only essential uh, travel is allowed between our countries. So right now, we are um, telling people that for tourism purposes, um, you have you have to wait. I mean, of course, we all want to uh, run away <laughs> to a beautiful beach in Mexico right now with this weather um, and the other way around. Uh, but we are telling people that if that is not um, an essential travel, please try to um, be safe, be at home, because as we, ha as we have seen, um, the COVID-19 cases have um, increased recently. 
um, here in the US and also in Mexico, in Europe. So that is the restriction that we have in place, but trade um, is, is, is going uh, with a normal uh, fluency. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, the other thing that I had a question on was, you know, some of the experience that you've had working in the Midwest, because you had a, what was your post before coming to Chicago? Um, before I was posted in Mexico City at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, at the um, Office of the Chief of Staff of the Ministry. And so, it, so tell us about your experience now that you've been here a year and a half. It's uh, definitely, is much different than Mexico City. And Mexico City is a small place, only, what, 26, 27 million people. So versus the density of downtown Chicago, it's only 10 times the size of the city, city limits of the city of Chicago. So I don't think a lot of people understand that it's 10 times bigger than the, cent the, the urban district of the city of Chicago. Even though um, the size is different, let me tell you that the traffic is the same. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, but now you have our wonderful winters and you're at 600 feet above sea level instead of, uh, what is it, uh, 5,000 feet. How, how much above sea level is Mexico City? It's like 5,000 feet? I think so. Yeah, it's, it's really high. Yeah. Because I remember flying down to Mexico City, you know, for my honeymoon, and uh, this the day after getting there, going to climb the uh, pyramids of the sun and the moon. Uh, after just coming from basically sea level, it was not. Uh, it it was great to be on the top of the, the the pyramids, but that's a very high altitude. Yes, many people have uh, experienced problems uh, with the altitude in Mexico City. That's true. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if anybody gets a chance to go to Mexico City itself, it is a beautiful, beautiful city with such great culture and uh, definitely a, a wonderful history with the pre-colonial times uh, from learning about the life and the times from that. But from you being here, what are some of the big things that, uh, besides the cold, has been the biggest adjustments? Um... I would say that here in Chicago, you have a very good um, public transportation system. Um, um, the traffic, as I was saying, is the same here as in Mexico City. Um, of course, the, uh, the snow and the cold weather is also uh, very, very different. Um, the food, the Mexican food, I'm really surprised to tell you that you have a very good Mexican food here in Chicago. So I don't miss that. Um, and pretty much is the same. Um, maybe people don't realize it, but um, Mexico and the US, we are pretty similar. Um, so the adjustment um, has not been like significant for me. Okay, okay. No, that's good to know. And, 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 and with, a lot of people really don't understand how similar the cultures are between the United States and Mexico, especially the, say, San Diego, Los Angeles area, you know, Phoenix, Tucson, and Chicago with such strong presence, and also Texas as well. Uh, but the influence of the two, especially um, down the block from where I am, I can get some, some really good mole that competes with the mole in Oaxaca. And so it was just really good to see the, the, the types of food that you can get, the types of culture. Um, oh, and I can't remember, what is the name of the festival dancing with the young women that are dancing with the very colorful um, dresses from traditional dancing? Uh, well, it depends on the region. I don't know if you are oh, okay. um, thinking about Gelaguetza in Oaxaca, which take, takes place um, in July. Uh, but we do have very different uh, dances across the country. Yeah, okay, I didn't know that. So with part of the, uh, we'd also used to have a large uh, um, Mexican Independence Day parade in Waukegan that would draw 
roughly 60,000 people to the area. And so you would have the dancers uh, leading that parade and all the different uh, music that's happening behind that. Uh, and had a thought too that I just lost, but it is just really interesting seeing the, the culture from Mexico really permeating uh, North Lake County and having a lot of these uh, uh, bilateral uh, communications, which I think is really great. And I know going forward, one, when uh, restrictions are opening up, I definitely love to have you come up and learn more about the, the Waukegan area, because I don't believe you've made it this far north, at least with us. And then uh, looking forward to de developing our Select Chicago community tours again. I think uh, there's a lots of great different opportunities that um, working with your office and showcasing Mexico is a good place to invest and develop uh, stronger relations. I think is just it's a great win-win. And so, um, and so, yeah. So, Rocio, anything else you want to add before we bring to a close today? Yes, just uh, a couple of things. Um, now that you were talking about the culture uh, here, uh, the culture, the Mexican culture here in the U.S., we have seen like these kind of merging cultures between the two countries with Halloween and the Day of the Dead that is approaching. Uh, so Halloween is in October uh, 31st, and um, Day of the Dead is November 2nd. So, uh, and that is a very uh, interesting and important celebration for us because we believe that that day, uh, our beloved ones that have already passed away visit us. Uh, they come and they eat with us because we uh, make, we establish an, an altar, an ofrenda in our houses in which we uh, put um, their favorite food. We put a picture uh, of them. So we believe that that day um, they come with us to stay. Uh, so it's a very, a very nice uh, celebration. So unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we were not able to do like um, uh, activities outside. Where, but I invite you to look into our Facebook page uh, of the Consulate General of Mexico, because we are going to have some activities uh, related to the Day of the Dead, so you can learn more about this celebration. And uh, also, um, yes, we do miss uh, our trips with Select Chicago. So I hope um, in the near future we can uh, restart uh, those activities. And I invite everyone to visit our webpage uh, that approach the Consulate General of Mexico if you have any doubts or questions. Wonderful. And uh, the Day of the Dead is a very big celebration in Waukegan. And I got to go to Oaxaca for the Day of the Dead um, a long time ago and just seeing the immense um, really celebration of bringing your loved ones back or your loved ones who have passed back is just a sight to behold. And again, I thank you so much for giving us your time today. And it's always a real, I always enjoy speaking with you and, and learning on ways that we can work together. And so, Rosia, I look forward to uh, connecting with you soon. We have a lot of great plans for 2021. I'm sure I'll be talking to you in the next couple of weeks of how we can uh, work together uh, moving forward. So I'm going to say goodbye, and I look forward to uh, talking with you in the future. All right. Thank you, Michael.